Morning, I'm Ray Percival, no relation to Colin. <laughs> um, I build just a little bit of background. I do data center networking, um, several very large data centers, heavily virtualized environment. Um, and so networking in virtualized environments and with virtualized gear is kind of a big interest of mine because it's important and it's something that we're all going to be doing more of. Basically, we want to talk about how we can leverage OpenBSD and the BSDs in general to make the virtual world a little less chaotic and a little less scary. So, as you all probably know, the BSDs and TCPIP go way back. The first TCPIP implementations came out of Berkeley and pretty much all modern TCPIP stacks go back to a BSD. Um, nearly all IPsec goes back to the first OpenBSD implementation. And there is, in my opinion, a strong and sustainable argument to be made that the BSD um, network implementations, the TCPIP stacks, et cetera, are the best in the world across the board. And there is a extremely strong argument to be made that the BSD and ISC style licensing is one of the reasons why the internet works as well as it does without those standards. The interoperability and the fact that it's not viral, things would suck a lot more. <laughs> so it's a logical platform to use for heavy duty networking. A uh, brief outline of the history of the TCP IP stack. And so the BSDs, and this is one of the reasons why Juniper, Netscaler, several of the other large vendors use them so much is they enable the habits of good engineers. It enables laziness of action. The configurations are easy and good and it's remarkably easy to spin up an OpenBSD box that is ready to do industrial side, you know, big networks out of the box. The documentation is really nice. Um, we attempt to not make a mess out of it, which is good. Uh, parsimony. Um, as a person coming from the network side of the house, I hate complex network configurations. They're the enemy. And the OpenBSD network configurations are incredibly parsimonious and easy. So powerful tools for networking and troubleshooting and general computing. I mean, we have VLANs built in that are incredibly easy. Trunking incredibly easy, um, things like RelayD where you can turn up a load balancer that competes with any of the major vendors out of the box. Um, everything's integrated is another thing that I like because it's all in base. RelayD, VLANs, everything you need to network is in base. It's integrated, you get the stability, you get the logical defaults. Um, things work well. Responsive developers, standards compliant. So especially on a VM, you can spin up an OpenBSD install with basically all the networking bits that you need in something like 10 minutes. Um, zero touch provisioning is awesome, especially in the data center. Um, everything in base and the, specific, and the ability to do customized rollouts with the host specific sets and site specific scripts across to the data center, that's incredibly important and it's really cool when you start building large scale virtualized um, environments because if you want to spin up your load balancer and you're spinning this up as a virtual load balancer for a hundred customers across, you know, ten machines, having that level of automation is absolutely critical. And integration makes complex things really easy to set up. Um, one of the examples that I use, and it's a rather trivial example, but it's cool, is the DHCPD integration and the PF integration means you can spin up and prototype a machine to enforce um, MAC addresses in minutes. 
Um, NSH is a really cool tool. Um, actually, Peter put it in ports after I whined at him a lot about it. Um, one of the things it brings is the ability to give your overnight guys these very simple configurations that they can drop on and to make your configuration very network-like. It feels, if you come from the Cisco, Juniper, Arista, whatever side of the house, it feels very intuitive, it feels very natural because the configurations are in a logical way that you're used to. So specifically about virtualization. We, OpenBSD plays nice with essentially all the hypervisors and the ones that they, it doesn't yet, it's being worked on. Um, VXLAN is, VXLAN is fascinating and VXLAN is what's going to take up a large part of the talk. But so OpenBSD had the first implementation of VXLAN and it is in many ways by far the best. And it's basically a tool to build overlay networks. So an underlay network is the physical network as it's laid out. Switches, firewalls, layer one, layer two, getting packets from here to there. And it's pretty complex and ran by, well, people like myself. What an overlay network allows you to do is virtualize all of that away. You virtualize all of that away, you can chop down, you can get rid of all the layer two complexity. Well, you can't get rid of the complexity, but you can hide it. You can hide it from yourself. So where I might give you a VM over here and you have a VM over here, two different hypervisors, two different layer two networks, everything routed in between here, all that complexity that you don't want to deal with. Use VXLAN to essentially build a tunnel that encapsulates the packets from here, takes it over here, and treats it to your endpoints. It looks like it's one great big happy VLAN or subnet. And that allows things like to do CARP between hypervisors. Um, backups are particularly nice with this because a lot of backup tools assume that you're going to be on the same VLAN. And so it simplifies a lot of that. It can allow you to get past a lot of the limitations that might be put on you by a infrastructure as a service or for purposes of this talk, cloud um, provider. Um, by being able to build tunnels between different environments, different subnets, it doesn't matter if you get spun up on this host or if you get spun up on a data center 100 miles away from your other data center, as long as you have connectivity. I mean, if you can get ping through, you can virtualize all of that away. It's really exciting stuff. Um, and it allows a lot of automation. Um, RelayD. RelayD is a pretty amazing tool. And I'm not saying that just because the man is here. Um, I was going to say, you're going to like the next one, yeah. <laughs> um, so RelayD is a load balancer on par with any of the big names at this point. Netscaler, F5, RelayD can do essentially everything they can do, and it runs on a nice base OpenBSD box, which is really nice. CARP, of course, we all know CARP. CARP is extremely useful for redundancy. PF is kind of the gold standard. Um, VLANs, I have my VLAN sample code and I mean, so it's dead easy, bridging is nice. One of the things I love, really like about networking with OpenBSD is the rapid prototyping and specifically in a virtual environment, the ability to do a proof of concept in an hour or an afternoon for something really complex is incredibly nice. And with some of the tools that we have, it doesn't really matter where you're doing it because you can make it work. Um, so yeah, the ability to do rapid prototyping, more than once I've done things that would have cost tens of thousands of dollars from a vendor or taken a very, very long time in an afternoon 
with tools essentially in base. So the other kind of communication. Um, here's kind of the thing is between network people and systems people, there's a bit of a gap. But if we communicate with code or configuration snippets, it reduces a lot of miscommunication. And that's one of the things that I like about specifically using OpenBSD for, for communication is I take, for example, the VLAN configuration from an OpenBSD box. I hand that to somebody who's been doing VLANs their whole life on Cisco. They can see what I did there with pretty much no, pre pretty much instantly they can see what I did there. And that's really powerful because you improve the amount of, because you reduce miscommunication. And I mean, if you're looking at the configuration, you know what is. So that's really pretty powerful. And it's a dramatic difference from some other operating systems. Um, VRF light and VRF, and I don't actually have an example. Um, so VRF light is in OpenBSD base, integrated with PF, integrated with all the routing daemons. It's there. You spin up a box on base. You have all the tools you need. Um, and again, the other thing I like about it is the configuration. If you do what you need to do to do the configuration, and you'll see some examples later. I decided not to put in any examples since there's a whole talk on it in a, few, in a little bit. If you do that configuration and you hand it again to your Cisco guy, your Juniper guy, the network guy who's never touched a BSD box, she'll know instantly what you did there because it goes through a logical, it uses a lot of the similar syntax. It was obviously written and designed by people who have to work with it for a living, which again, I really like. Three basic commands to set it up and works like you'd expect it to if you've used any other implementation. So if you've set it up on Cisco, if you've set it up on um, Juniper, any place else, it essentially, I mean, if you've done VRFs on Juniper, Cisco, whatever, it works like it was. And <laughs> again, I started reading how to do it on Linux, got tired, needed a nap. So. I mean, that's literally all it takes to create a VLAN on OpenBSD. Configure your switch right, plug it in on the other end, you're good to go. And that is, to a networker, that's an incredibly intuitive configuration. Walk through it, spin up your interface, create your VLAN, assign your VLAN to the interface, give it the IP, done. So now is a good time for an aside on pets versus livestock in the virtual world, since we're going to get into hypervisors here shortly. So it's the idea of, are you ready for infrastructure as a service or for cloud or to virtualize? And if your servers are pets, you probably aren't. If they're named and you mourn when they go down and that's a problem, you probably don't, you probably have a problem. On the other hand, livestock, if your app is written or whatever you're doing is written in such a way that you can take them down, bring them up, you know, run Chaos Monkey, have everything go up, down, backwards with them, then you're ready. And the thing that the networking side can bring here is the ability to move things around. So for example, if you decide you want to go from AWS to some other provider that has cheap, in fact, there are literally, I was just telling about spot, the spot markets in cloud computing, people will sell you capacity on whatever provider you want and you just move your stuff around and that's pretty powerful. Um, there's some quality issues there of course, but so on the other hand, everything isn't exactly rosy. <laughs> and he is not wrong, but we are going to be running things in a virtual world. As the other talks here make clear, and as makes clear, I mean, we can't keep the whole thing, we physically can't keep the whole thing lumbering along on all physical machines at this point. So we have to virtualize. The goal is how to make it suck less. 
and by leveraging OpenBSD for the networking, you can make it suck less to a large degree. It's that's going to be critical. So I solicited some Twitter advice about um, if anybody else had a VXLAN implementation, since I couldn't actually find any mention from on Google of anybody else having one. Um, and that was her response I got back, which it amused me. Do you want a picture? So a little more in depth. To the um, a little more in depth to the overlay network thing, and I was um, too lazy slash busy slash socializing to make my own drawings. So I'm going to have drawings with um, ignore the fact that I'm not actually using the example VLAN ranges because I just stole these basically. So the upper drawing shows what's called your underlay network. So you have your server, a VM in this case, connected with your vSwitch to your gateway, which again is just another VM there. And that can go over any network. Now this shows it you know, going over the same subnet. Then your gateway has a connection out to the internet. We'll ignore for the moment all the stuff in between of it and the internet. Over to your client, which is on a completely different subnet. Mm -hmm. Doing a lot of stuff over that setup gets to be difficult. For example, if you wanted to do database replication, that's a hard problem with just access to the underlay network. You're also at the whim of a lot of stuff there that you don't want to deal with. Um, and in particular, if you were running in a highly managed virtualized environment with that first setup, you would have to talk to somebody like me quite a bit to make changes to that. And you would probably be going through a gateway you didn't control, but if you're in that kind of an environment, a gateway that you do control has problems because, again, you don't necessarily control all of the routing and everything out on all the part there that's hidden by that v, hidden by v switch there. So the bottom drawing shows a very basic um, overlay network using VXLAN. So your server still talks to your bridge, but it's just a straight bridge to network at that point. Um, and then you have your internet, and then you basically build a VXLAN tunnel that says take anything for 10.0.0.2 and send it down the tunnel. This is, of course, a very basic setup. Um, and that virtualizes away all of that underlay and gives you a nice machine to machine, end to end connection to do whatever with. Um, one of the things this is really powerful for is, say, these were different hypervisors in different data centers, it would let you migrate your VMs without having to take them down because you have just eliminated the whole you can only migrate VMs on the same subnet problem. So that's basically overlay networking in a nutshell. And it's a powerful tool. So like I was saying, migrating between hypervisors. So if you're going, say, from VMware to Beehive, or Zen to Beehive, or Beehive to Zen, or wherever to wherever, it simplifies that greatly because to the machine, everything looks like it's on the same subnet. Um, mixed hypervisor environments. So Zen and VMware, if you have to go between subnets, don't really play nice together. So again, using the VXLAN to simplify all of that will get rid of that. And OpenBSD is probably better for it because you're not at the whims of vendors. 
Um, and migrate VMs between different VLANs and subnets is important. Um, another one, for example, is if you have a VM in a vendor environment and you don't trust the vendor provided VPN or you don't want to pay whatever outrageous price they're charging you for a VM route or for a IP VPN, sorry, <laughs> or you don't want to pay, pay whatever outrageous price they're charging you for a VPN connection, you simply, you go back, you spin up a gateway on the subnet there with your server, pay just for whatever, the, you get the regular internet connection out, which normally you couldn't do a VPN over because there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. They don't let you into the real IP address. Getting them to set up inbound connections is a pain for whatever reason. Set that up, set up the um, other client at your office that you want to have the VPN connection to. Set up a VXLAN tunnel, which requires you to ask to open one port, essentially. And boom, you bypass, you have your VPN under your control. You've greatly simplified things, and you don't have to necessarily pay for your vendor for whatever they're charging you for the VPN. Um, it can also, if you have, as is popular, a lot of people these days will set up multiple environments because it'll spin up, I mean, in an infrastructure as a service, it'll spin up your environment wherever it spins it up. You can set it up and suddenly you don't care because you can relatively easily make all of your stuff play nice with each other. Um, downsides of VXLAN. There's no security whatsoever. This is not a VPN by itself. It's essentially a tunnel over which you can build a VPN, but it's not a VPN by itself. It has no security to it. It does depend on the underlying physical network and routing. So it can be used, it can't, it can be used to compensate for bad network designs, but it probably shouldn't. Um, but you can use it once you have a solid underlay network, you can then use it to do really interesting things that would otherwise cost a lot of money. Um, one of the things you can do with it that's really important is if you get on a hypervisor and you have a given hypervisor that is running really hot, if you have VXLAN, it makes it really easy to quickly do a migration to another hypervisor. It also makes it easier to spread out your machines. So if you need to spread out machines across, say, 20 hypervisors across two data centers, all you have to do is talk them into a data center to data center connection. And if your machines all need to appear to be on the same subnet, you can do that. I'm obviously quite excited about this. <laughs> Um, so things, yes? Another exciting thing about VXLAN is also that it works in point to multi point, which is you can, it's not just a tunnel, right? You can connect multiple sites and they find each other. Yes. Like virtual Ethernet with multicast? Yes, yes. Um, are you using that or is it? Uh, I'm not using it yet. No, I, I, I know it exists, but I'm not using it. I, mostly because I haven't found a way to use it yet <laughs> or a chance to use it. And it just works, it treats it. <laughs> and, and one other thing, there's a second protocol, NVGRE, which is basically the same, it's from Microsoft for Hyper-V. We looked into adding this, uh, and, and I looked at this, and then I said, okay, let's make a Google Summer of Code project out of it, and nobody applied, so I gave up on Google Summer of Code, but uh, so. I really added myself at some point. It's easy. So. Nice, so we basically get it for free. Almost. Yeah, it's the code infrastructure is there in the VXLAN implementation, and all we just have to patch our GRE every single time. <laughs> Both Microsoft and VMware are consolidating to the new. Sorry? Are you aware of the new decoding that Microsoft and VMware are consolidating their next code? VMware and Linux have this, uh, Microsoft has the NVGRE. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a new thing called the new decoding. 
If it's similar, then you can talk to that as well. I think it's similar, and I think it's, you know, I think it's tough if you get uh, into VMware and into Microsoft, I'm not sure what to do. Ah, oh, okay. Basically. Well, thanks. Uh, right, and the other nice thing about VXLAN is it's also being used by a lot of the um, unicorn slash SDN people. They use it a lot for their unicorns. So, I mean, it's really nice because it allows seamless integration into a lot of that. And I haven't, well, so yeah, easy mobility and cloud spot markets overlays let you le leverage that. So, I mean, if you want to move between to wherever the cheaper infrastructure, it really does enable in a lot of ways the promise of moving between things. Um, Relay D, free functional secure load balancing with some really cool tools and really easy to set up. I think I set up the implementation I have running for demo purposes. I started spinning up the um, VMs for it when we ordered dinner last night, and by the time we were eating, I had it mostly working. <laughs> um, the mostly parts because I have a crappy hypervisor on the laptop. Um, it's another story. Um, mostly feature complete with major vendors. So I mean, the thing is, and the reason why that's important is because you're going to have customers asking, F5 can do this, Netscaler can do this, we can do the other here. Can you do this? And I mean, it's important to give that to to them. That's how you sell it. So I mean, and again, also from a networking point of view, if you know F5, if you know Netscaler, if you know how to load balance, you know how to use Relay D because it keeps the concepts, it keeps a config language that is really understandable. I mean, it's a little bit different, but it's really understandable. Actually, it's really understandable. And again, virtual LBs are portable, fast, easy to deploy. You know, I have them spun up really quick and manage and monitor with your existing tools. So if you're running BSD servers, specifically OpenBSD servers, but anything, and you're using Salt to manage those, you can now use Salt to manage all your stuff, Salt, Ansible, whatever. You're basically, you can now manage all your network crap with all the crap that you already manage all your other crap with. And so all the crap you already have and know and love or don't hate or hate less or whatever. <laughs> um, the other upside to that is again, it's standards compliant. Um, and of course, deployment tools that you have work. So you don't have to write or go through another workflow to deploy a virtual firewall or to deploy a virtual load balancer or to spin up a load balancer. You just do it with all the tools that you already have and use. As long as OpenBSD is a possible guest on your systems, it just works because it's all in base, which is sweet. PF. It's the gold standard. Um, really don't need to say a lot else about it. Um, R domains, sweet, sweet VRF light. Without VRF light, multi tenancy is impossible. Without multi tenancy, the modern data center is essentially impossible. Um, I'm not going to go deep into R domains because Peter will be going much more in depth on them, but they're basically, they are critical to multi-tenancy. With the R domain and PF integration, we are remarkably close on OpenBSD to being able to build virtual firewalls on par with any of the current big names. Um, there's a couple bits that I either haven't been able to figure out yet or haven't been able to find yet, and I may very well get corrected and be ha ever so happy for that. But we're basically on track. I mean, we have almost all the tools to compete with the Cisco's, the Junipers, the Checkpoints, the Palo Altos on virtualized firewalling. It's really exciting, and it's really exciting for me because I kind of have that old school BSD religion. I want it to be in base, and if it's not in base, it's crap. 
Um, and having all of that in base on a machine I can spin up in 10 minutes, <laughs> that's fun. And of course, we can run multiple VMs for isolation in the meantime. So since they're so light and we can spin up, you know, 10 VMs, run the firewalling through that, call it a day. Um, our domains on our back end, um, potential for our, well, our domains and RelayD, you get probably enough separation and honestly more separation than most of your major vendors provide today. And you can set up a multi-tenant firewall. I mean, you can set up, um, to borrow a phrase from VMware, you can basically set up a virtual data center on a box running pretty much nothing but OpenBSD. And that's pretty awesome. Um, plays nice under all major hypervisors. I'm, well, um, basically, I mean, it plays nice under VMware, QMA, Zen-based stuff. Um, I forget, Beehive is either getting support or has support? Has support. Has support. Um, and I've heard some other seriously cool rumors that I'm not sure I'm at. I'm not sure how much I should talk about, but there are some other seriously cool rumors. So, I mean, that basically under all is becoming true. Efficient networking, I mean, it's a great networking stack constantly being improved. And of course, manage your crap with the crap you already have to manage your other crap, which, <laughs> yes? Yeah, um, when you see anything supportable on major hypervisor, do you mean OpenBSD already have what was like, uh, what lines the drivers to run on Kubernetes or do you have what you it, 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 it can run as a guest under, with the exception of the Microsoft stuff, and that's actually possibly changing. It runs as a guest, I mean, OpenBSD installs and runs as a guest under pre everything I can think of. So VMware, Beehive, Zen, QEM, e, um, Um, it installs and runs with, well, it usually installs and runs with the Intel 1000. E EMO is the NIC that it typically uses, but I mean, they all have the EMO driver that works with OpenBSD. So, 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 so yeah, your NIC, your, your NIC is going to be EMO, EM1 under most hypervisors. That's the default that most hypervisors use when they see OpenBSD. Right. They support virtual Right. Um, I was going to say, yes, yes, yes. And that's actually, that's actually way cool. So, so in a couple of VM class, or so, so in a couple of VMware classes that I've taken in the past couple of years, yeah, I'll um, always spin up a OBSD guest or two because of course I will. And yeah, being able to spin it up and put on the VMX NIC with like this image that I downloaded, that's just, it's awesome because <laughs> you get all that for free because people who use it are building it. And that's kind of where I get really excited about OpenBSD specifically is the development is pretty much done by people who do this crap for a living. And so it's just, it's beautiful when it gets down to a knuckle dragger like me because it's all there built by people who, you know, kind of think like me, not to insult anybody. <laughs> Um, bridges and switching. So OpenBSD has absolutely wonderful bridging. Um, the first time I spun it up, I sat down with a Socris and a couple of docs. Hadn't ever done it before. Half an hour later, I had a very slow, very low port density switch. <laughs> but, you know, it got the job done. Um, Multi-protocol by default, which <laughs> which is fun because you know multi-protocol um, or multi-layer switches are all the rage, 
And as opposed to having to figure out what in the, in the hell license Cisco is going to allow me to put on it, um, I have it all right there. Um, and of course, again, I have a thing for management because as a professional networker, I am sick and tired of configuring network devices by hand. I am so done with that. And the more we can get standard, sane, preferably BSD OSs doing jobs here, the faster I can start using all these tools that the server guys talk about that I get seriously jealous of. And so, in theory, you can build a virtual switch to work with public IP APIs under, again, pretty much all major hypervisors. It can, in theory, be done under VMware, the Open vSwitch guys. They use all public hypervisor. They use all public APIs to run under. Um, VMware. So it's theoretically possible. I couldn't do it and it would require somebody a lot smarter than me to do the work. But in theory, it's possible to build a virtual switch out of OpenBSD, which would be very exciting um, because, again, you would have all those management tools and you wouldn't have to go through, go worship at the altar of the Cisco pricing structure. And a slight aside into white box switching or bare metal switching. Um, so in the networking world, merchant silicon is becoming very popular. This whole idea that a Cisco is going to design an ASIC from the ground up, integrate the software into it, build releases that are specific to that ASIC, and release these switches on very slow release cycles and have these very slow vendor driven upgrade cycles is becoming really unpopular. People are really quite done with that. Um, Arista has kind of completely proven that you can take one of the off the shelf, mostly Broadcom ASICs, plug it into a machine spin up a stock OS, write some drivers, dump it on there, and have incredibly high performance switches that people get just really excited about. And from the system side, it seems kind of obvious. You know, you the system side has been managing things with things like salt, APIs, configuration, all of that for a long time. While networkers are still managing huge bits of infrastructure by SSHing to a machine, writing a config, SSHing to another machine, writing a config, telnetting to that damn switch that you hate, writing another machine, writing another config. And as a group, getting tired of it, and I'm just done. So being able to build this off of it and get the drivers. Mostly commodity hardware. Again, the ASICs are, you know, kind of the elephant in the room. Um, the issue, of course, is convincing Broadcom to give up the documentation to allow us to write the drivers. Of course, as the OpenBSD community is well known for, and FreeBSD, and basically everybody is, you know, we don't want drivers from you. Give us the documentation. Give us the info we need to write the drivers. We have the people to write the drivers, and we have the people to write better drivers. The key, of course, is talking those vendors out of that documentation, and that's a huge project. But it's a potentially really exciting one. So Arista, of course, runs on pretty much a stock Red Hat. Well, CentOS, actually. Networkers get incredibly excited about this because you show them dropping into the shell there and all the things you can do on a switch with configuration, getting information off of it, testing. If you have access to the shell, yeah, well, I want that on BSD. I can't do it, but I want that on BSD, and I think it would be a huge win because we'd be able to create some really cool tools. So that's an aside on that. So concerns about 
virtualization in all its forms. Quality is a concern. When we get into a world where we're spinning up machines and when they have problems we're killing them and we're spinning them up again and we risk stop trouble, stopping actual troubleshooting, you know, destroy the machine and rebuild it is the new reboot. And quality becomes a concern with that. And it's something I think that we need to be concerned as a community about how to get that balance between moving fast and maintaining the kind of quality that we're all used to. On the other hand, we have really powerful tools. And we have tools that can be leveraged in really interesting ways once they start to capture the imagination and to increase our flexibility a lot. Um, then we get into the area of complex yet fragile systems. So we build all that and we add redundancy and we have, and so imagine we add in a couple of gateways there because we're obviously going to want redundancy. We run CARP through them. We're building our tunnel. We're running CARP on the other end because obviously we want redundancy there. We have all the stuff that's actually at the physical layer below the logical underlay there. And we've built this highly redundant, powerful system, but it has some fragility built in. And it's similar. There's actually researchers from the biology, from the biology side doing research into how ecosystems become really complex and yet fragile. And a lot of it's surprisingly applicable to networks. Um, so the fragility that is introduced ironically with the increase in complexity that we get as we try to be more redundant and as we virtualize a lot of things is a concern. Um, the BSDs can help make them less fragile because we're building solid tools, we're building well-designed tools, we're building simple tools to do complex jobs. It can help to be, make things considerably less potentially fragile. So now a bit of a demo. As I was saying, this is the I don't have my relay. Yeah, we'll turn on my relay thing actually. So this is running under parallels and it has some kind of problem with the EM client, but it's a crappy desktop. But this is the setup that I spun up last night over dinner. It is, as you can see, a really basic setup. Um, so we define our external address, aka our, what's going to eventually be our virtual IP. We define our pool, a couple of web servers sitting behind it. We put them actually into the pool. Again, really intuitive syntax. Uh, set up the interval. So the interval is how often it pool it, it is how often it probes each server to make sure it's up. Um, set up, define what we want HTTP to look like for purposes of this, for the protocol, and then we actually bind it all together with our relay HTTP proxy. We're listening on the external address on 80 listening for AD, forwarding to our web hosts on port load balance, and we have a checking that it gets back a 200 to mark our servers up. Because if the server you know, stops returning 200, we want it to be removed from the pool. We do relay show hosts. It shows us how often our, it shows us what our servers have been up. It shows us how many checks we have. You show that to a networker who has spent their whole life working with F5 and Netscaler, they're going to be able to read that, instantly know what's, what they're looking at. It's really intuitive. So then our web servers are just running a basic, a real basic setup. So the client using 203.0.13.2. 
We do curl, it gets, I'm, now let's see if I remember how to disable that. Huh? Not relay, relay Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the funny thing is, I have that in my other example. Disable host. Oh, wait. No, it's host disable. Right. And it helps if I know how to type, which is not, again, the fault of the operating system. <laughs> Oddly enough, nobody's got to be drunk enough yet to put um, OBSD on it natively, maybe tonight. And it starts returning from Web Server 1. And if I have my other, I don't know if I have. I think I dorked my other client to do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm running the one I'm running. <laughs> so at home, I have um, ESXi running on a Mac Mini crammed full of memory. Um, and I am considering, after being here, going completely crazy and putting, um, well, not completely crazy, but I'm considering. So I have ESXi running on it because it's useful for me to know for work. I'm considering putting Beehive on it because I want to start playing with Beehive. I've gotten really excited about Beehive. Um, And I wasn't able to get my, um, so I wasn't able to get my VXLAN demo working because, so there we can see one going to one, the other going to other. I don't quite have the load balancing set up so that it'll do the whole cycle through the thing. So. Parallels doesn't have a proper virtual switch, so I wasn't able to get my VXLAN stuff actually working. But I mean, to demonstrate how I'm, yeah, I'm considering, yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Huh? Did you try virtual one? Virtual, yeah, yeah. Basically, basically, I threw Parallels on because I bought the laptop the night before I traveled, so I needed something that was really fast, and I didn't feel like spending money without doing a little more research. So, no, I've been considering VirtualBox and Fusion, yeah, either. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, as you can see, there's where I have the bridge set up, the VXLAN, VXLAN going down, and it really is. I mean, I mean, that's the configuration. This is a really basic setup. But I mean, that's the that's all there is to it, and that's as a networker, that is incredibly exciting to me. And you hand that to 
say you have somebody setting up a VXLAN, ter say you're terminating this tunnel instead of on another OpenBSD box on a Juniper. How are you just going to add, for example, IPsec or VPN layer? Well, so, so the VXLAN tunnel provides the tunnel or the road. And extending that analogy a little is, yeah, then you run your IPsec stuff over it. Those are the cars running over the road. So whatever your peer is on the other end, that's what you build the tunnel to, to add security to it. So, 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 so you're basically, you're building the road with the VXLAN tunnel and then your IPsec stuff, you're running as the cars over that road. So in this case, I have it set up, we're coming from 198, 51, 101, going to 102. So if I wanted to then, yes. Oh, I love the six-month support cycle. Oh, no, once you learn to, what? It's death to me, that's why I stopped using OpenBSD. Well, well I, I was going to say, actually, actually, OpenBSD has, actually, Juniper probably stole it since OpenBSD probably had it first, but OpenBSD actually has the same sort of release cycle that Juniper does. I mean, if you have to sell that to, say, management, it's exactly the release cycle that um, Juniper does. They, 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 they do a new release every six months, and it's officially supported for a year. So with Juniper, if I want support, even if I'm running, I can be running Unos 10. If I find a bug in it, Juniper will patch that bug in and say, oh, go with Unos 10. It's a six-month problem. Assuming you have backed the big truck, of, and I work for somebody who has backed that big truck of money up to them. But I mean, assuming you pack, you, you backed a big truck of money up to them, sure. Um, assuming you don't have the big truck of money. That's not my definition of production. That's. Well, but if you do have that truck of money, I'm pretty sure the SDSC developer would be happy to take your money. <laughs> I was going to say, there, 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 there are people. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you could talk to um, either of these gentlemen, and I'm sure. I'm sure there's make a sales pitch? The absolutely, sir. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> For a living, I run a company that offers, uh, let's say, commercially supported OpenBSD. Right? So just talk to me if you need it. We can give you ten years, but we go, we're going to charge ten years. And you, <laughs> and you know who he is, right? Yes. <laughs> just wanted to make sure. <laughs> I hadn't met him before, so I wouldn't have recognized him before now. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, it is. And now, joking aside, it is a concern. And the last place I really ran it a lot in production was where I had enough trust from my boss that he would let me spin up things and he would let me do it. And you really do. I mean, that gets into the whole, how do you deploy any of this in production where it's not already? But one of the things I like about it and one of the reasons why I get personally really excited about how well all of this works under virtualized environments. Because if I can, you know, get them to give me a space on a hypervisor and I can do some proof of concept, take it to my boss, show them how well it works. Like the first thing next week I'm going to be doing is spinning up a lab off of a VM, you know, off of a set of VMs that I have to show how we're going to use VXLAN to solve a customer problem. And if I can do that proof of concept, take it to them, that makes selling that considerably easier. The other problem I've run into is, for example, throughput. OpenBSD in a VM environment, and maybe I'm missing something that other people have solved, but no matter which set of drivers, no matter which set of hypervisors, no matter which set of anything I put in, I have yet to see an OpenBSD VM guest achieve 
there are some some bottlenecks. So you're looking into things like running tickless or something like that. But um, it just got better actually, even more than the like yeah. introduction. Those two five six VMs running on the same host KVM, not TFS. Uh, That <laughs> I get excited about it. I get excited about it because I like running something that I have that level of control over where I can. And that makes me happy. And it's under rapid development. And, you know, I will be the first to tell you some of this is you know, stuff that's going to be cool as it continues working on and stuff that's cool and stuff that I think is cool to start thinking about now because we're getting there and we're building it out and I particularly am getting really excited about Beehive. So, I also think it's cool because a lot of the systems guys, I mean, I would love to see more people doing networking. So that's just me. Any more questions? Cool. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah. Do you have any like, real life examples you would want to share about the real production networking team running out of this, of this setup? Just you know, give us kind of a number. Um, probably. I don't have anything off the top of my head right now, but it's possible. Now, I mean, where I've ran it, so, and actually, Peter, do you have any numbers from your setup that you can share? No, that's on physical hardware, but yeah. And like I said, I've noticed as I've run it over virtual environments, I don't have any exact numbers, but I mean, it has gotten significantly better. And I run mostly under VMware because of where I'm at and what I do. And yeah, with the VMX Net 3 drivers, I do pretty well on most things. Now, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything with OpenBSD really high traffic yet. Um, but the stuff that I do do, 
works fine. And I mean, we had a, so I did have a few years back a virtual machine. It was running under VMware at the time. Um, it was a little bit differently. This was an OFPF box. It was a gateway for access control to a series of VPN tunnels. And we were running three, 400 users through that at any given time. And this was four or five years ago. We were running three, 400 users through at any given time. And no complaints about the performance of the system, let me put it that way. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it was pretty heavy duty use, yeah. Um, no, not really. Yes. Excuse me? So, I mean, uh, you, you can't tell me you, uh, you just mentioned that there is one exception, right? In OpenBSD cannot run on laptop that have a way. Oh, the Hyper-V yeah. support? Yeah, where I have to, to run it in your GitHub. Like, oh, are you the person from? <laughs> oh, OK. Well, if you're going to say it, yeah. I mean, that's that, that, that was what I wasn't sure how much I should talk about it. But yeah, there were, I, yeah, I had talked with Rake last night about He had mentioned it to me. I didn't know you were the Microsoft person. Good to meet you. So yeah, I mean, and that is really exciting to me because yeah, being able to get some of these tools in those environments is cool. Because <laughs> those environments exist and they're powerful and they're cool and you, the more tools we have, the better it is. Yeah. I'm all about one big happy family just improving the state of engineering across the board. So yes. Oh. I understand have no connection with the <laughs> cool. So thank you all very much. I hope it was entertaining. <laughs>